Hi everyone, my name is Kirsten Page and I'm a professor in the music department at NC State. Today I'm coming to you from a redwood grove in Berkeley, California. In the last few years, Northern California has been threatened almost year-round by wildfires due to extreme drought conditions. Today, I'll talk about sounds of environmental changes like these. I'll discuss three approaches to recording, studying, and even crafting narratives about these sounds. First, I'll talk about a 19th century composer whose music was intended to replicate nature in sound and also tell stories about climate change. Next, I'll discuss an acoustic ecologist living here in Northern California who records and catalogs natural sounds over the course of decades to track changes in ecosystem health. And finally, I'll discuss a project at NC State that records urban soundscapes to expose disparities in noise pollution across cities. My questions for you, coming away from this brief introductory talk, are the following. Just how effective do you think sound or music can be in capturing the urgency of global change, especially climate change? What can music or soundscapes offer that science can't in terms of addressing the climate crisis and generating productive public responses? I'll offer two arguments today. First, that music can help us imagine distant futures. It can tell emotionally driven experimental stories about times and places that lie beyond the now. Music can tell us about how an individual artist perceives the world or envisions its future, and that musician can ask listeners to try on that world with them. In this way, music is an essential tool for thinking about global change, as are other forms of climate fiction that imagine the future and ask us how it feels to live there. Leaving the concert hall and listening to soundscapes, on the other hand, can expose audible changes to a given environment and provoke emotional responses to environmental change happening in real time. My second argument is that these kinds of soundscapes invite us to attend to both who and what is creating certain sounds, their changes over time, and what that tells us about environmental change, as well as how our reactions to environmental sounds can drive us towards certain kinds of behaviors. Musicians and ecologists alike are equally invested in environmental sound and are uniquely positioned to ask us how listening might help determine how we make our world, for better or for worse. Here's my first example. As early as 1772, natural scientists in Britain identified deforestation as a driver of local climate change, the King of England recommending planting trees to reduce air pollution. A few decades later, naturalists in France demanded a planetary medicine to address environmental threats as they described human beings as plagues of nature. By the end of the 19th century, geologists in Italy, Germany, and Britain were marked that human beings had become a geological element in their own right, and one that does not pale in the face of the greatest forces of the globe. 19th century musicians also remarked on the impact of human beings on the environment. One composer who did just that was Richard Wagner, the very famous German opera composer, who, among other things, invented new concepts of opera and theater, insisted upon the political importance of opera for the future of Germany, and developed ways of linking characters to musical themes that you can still hear in music today, especially in films. You might know him as the composer of this music, The Ride of the Valkyries, maybe from movies like Apocalypse Now. In 1850, Wagner wrote an essay called Art and Climate, in which he analogized his novel concept of opera to the northern German climate. In this essay, he wrote that operas would envelop listeners like a vaporous fog, would pour rain upon them, and was basically a sonic form of the streams, rocks, and forests of Germany. He imagined that people listening would inhale his music and that climate would spill from the mouths of his singers. Here's another example of what his music sounds like an excerpt from his opera Das Rheingold, about the pillaging of gold from a river. And you can imagine this multi-sensory piece of music being performed in a theater with real smoke and scents billowing off the stage and into the auditorium, produced by innovative steam machines. So Wagner imagined that his musical climates would have an immediate impact on spectators' bodies and minds. Their multi-sensory immersion in musical climates convincing them of whatever stories and morals he played out on stage. 
1876, he wrote a grand set of four mythic operas about anthropogenic environmental change called The Ring Cycle. You can imagine such a theme working very well for a composer whose music was literally a climate. All of the music I've played so far comes from these ring operas. And since their premiere, these operas have been interpreted as an environmentalist parable, an indictment of industrialism and capitalism, and as a warning about what might happen to our global environment if we aren't more careful. Writing amidst ongoing industrialism with these operas, Wagner imagined an apocalyptic environmental future with real implications for his contemporaries. Enveloping listeners in an influential musical climate and playing out a real climatic future on stage, he hoped that this story would drive 19th century listeners away from modernity and return back to a simpler, more natural, and more German way of life. You can find out much more about Wagner and climate in the essays that I've linked at the end of my talk, and also by attending performances at the North Carolina Opera. Here's my second example. Since at least the 1970s, non-musical sound, sometimes in combination with composed music and sometimes not, has also been used to understand the real-life, real-time degradation of our natural world. Building on recording practices developed in the 1970s, acoustic ecologist and audio engineer Bernie Krauss records and studies environmental sounds to track the effects of climate change on specific ecosystems, from the Great Barrier Reef to redwood forests here in California. Much like Wagner, Krauss describes the environment as a kind of music, the geophony, or sounds of the earth itself, biophony, sounds of living, non-human creatures, and anthropophony, sounds of human beings, falling into music-like registers of highs and lows. He analogizes the entire environment as a whole to the great animal orchestra. By recording the same habitats over as many as five decades, Krauss notes the significant changes caused by anthropogenic climate change that are more audible in some cases than visible. He, had, he describes a silence that seems to fall over certain environments after logging has taken place, and comments upon the immense sadness he can detect in the sounds made by animals after their habitats are destroyed. Krauss's perception of these sounds' emotional impact is almost as important as their biotic composition and the objective losses of life he's able to detect. For him, the emotional purchase of these sounds, as well as the changes they track over time, is what can drive attention and activism. Here's an example of him talking about the recordings he makes and sharing a few of them. Over 50% of my collection comes from habitats that are so radically altered, they're either altogether silent or can no longer be heard in their original form. Here's an example from Costa Rica. That's before logging, this is after. same spot. This is a coral reef, Vanua Levu in Fiji. Part of it is dying and part of it is still living. Here's what the living part sounds like. And here's what the dying part sounds like. Now on to my very last and third example. The kind of work Krauss does is essential to the National Park Service, which maintains a national sound map of the sonic conditions across our country. It acknowledges that when we go out in nature, we use all of our senses, and that our dedication to the protection of natural space is shaped in part by what we hear, what we want to hear, and how it all makes us feel. Listening to nature and determining what to do to preserve it is, in other words, as much about emotional response and effective reaction as it is about what's actually there. The Sound Around Town project at NC State contributes to the National Park Service's sound map. This project, which is led by Karen Cooper in Forestry and Environmental Resources, is a citizen-scientist-driven study of urban soundscapes and how individuals are impacted by them. It invites volunteers to record the sounds around them and track the relationship between how we feel about certain sounds and our perception of them as noise pollution. Today, I've introduced you to three approaches to thinking across environmental change and sound. Composers like Wagner generate abstract fictional climatic worlds, Krauss tracks environmental changes in real time, and Cooper and her team record and study forms of noise pollution in urban settings. These approaches to understanding environmental change through sounds seem quite distinct, and they certainly are. 
but they have a lot in common, too. In different ways, all three ask us to not just listen to what sounds are there, in an objective sense, and determine who or what is responsible for producing them, and then create a plan for preserving that world or creating a new one. Instead, they also ask us to be mindful of how we perceive those sounds, how perception shapes our impressions of environmental space and environmental change, and ultimately how perception affects how we live and the choices we make. Today, I hope you've learned a bit about what sound, music, and listening can contribute to our understanding and perception of climate change and its histories. We've known about climate change for a very long time, but in some ways, we're only just beginning to consider how music, sound, and listening can be useful in deepening that understanding. Thanks so much for your attention.